Hello, Ian. Hello. <laughs> Arnie Bieber here, ISP director. Nice to meet you. And uh, we're really excited to, uh, to, to uh, delve into the topic of curiosity. So it, let me just briefly welcome everyone in, uh, who's participating in this uh, first virtual edge in education uh, as we adapt to the current challenges that we face, but we are so thrilled that we can continue this journey of looking at where education and learning is going. And um, I, I think as by way of introduction, Ian, in addition to your writings, uh, on human behavior and specifically uh, your, your book, Curious. Uh, this is very relevant to ISP as well because we uh, have focused on understanding what does learning look like at our school at, or at any school for that matter. What do we want learning to be about uh, at ISP? And we talk about learning being a, a transformative process that deepens what we understand and ultimately changes who we are. And uh, one of our, our first learning principle is that learners curiosity drives what and how we learn. And so this topic of curiosity and the, the uh, centrality of it for learners and for how people uh, develop is really crucial to us. So we're really thrilled to have you speak to us, unfortunately, virtually, but thankful that you are there. Uh, and I assume you're in London, is that right? That's right, I'm in London, yes. Well, welcome uh, to ISP, welcome to our community, and we look forward to hearing your talk. Thank you very much. All right, just a quick, um, a lot of you've read Ian's bio, and you know that he's an accomplished uh, journalist and author, as well as a keynote speaker. And that's why we invited him today here, um, because our connection around curiosity. And Ian makes a passionate case for the cultivation of our desire to know and curiosity, which again, as Arnie said, links nicely to our learning principle about learning, learners' curiosity driving what and how they learn. So we're really set to keep, try to keep, find ways to keep our learners curious so that it drives deep learning and that they ultimately make a real difference in the world. And as Ian argues, um, curiosity is an equality you can rely on that it lasts a lifetime. We need to keep feeding that. We're all lifelong learners and we really look forward to Ian's insights and inspiration today for our ISP community. So with that, I turn it over to Ian. Thank you, Teresa, and uh, hello, everyone. Uh, good morning. It's very, very great to, to be talking to you all, all this morning uh, across Europe. Um, so this is the cover of my, this is the US cover, actually, of, of my book. Um, it's called Curious, uh, The Desire to Know and Why Your Future Depends on It. Um, it's a bit of a, it's a slightly finger wagging title. Um, it sounds a little bit like, unless, unless you buy my book, you don't have a future, which of course is the intention. Um, but the, the principle is that curiosity is an important trait at any time, um, but it's a particularly important one for us to, to think about and understand and cultivate at this moment in, in, in our history. Um, and I'm going to talk a bit about why in, in the opening section. And then also it's got an owl on the cover because who doesn't love owl? Um, so uh, it, was a, it was a surefire hit. Right now, let me make sure that I'm going on to the next slide. Here we go. So um, I started writing this book because I mean, curiosity is something that I've always been interested in. Um, and one of the things I started to think about was, why are some people incurious? Um, it doesn't make sense. I, it, it's, it's a bit of a, it's a strange failing to have. You can be curious if, if you decide to be. And it seems to me that curious people are more interesting and uh, better company um, and tend to be, you know, to have more interesting work and to do that work in a more interesting way, um, and often to be more more successful in in, in you know however, however they define success, um, and so I, I just sort of got really obsessed by this question about why do some people become incurious? Because you can tell when you sit next to somebody whether or not they're curious. There's a kind of light behind the eyes that that isn't 
there w when you're talking to an incurious person. Um, an incurious person can be perfectly uh, civil and, and polite and can go through the motions of, of social interaction perfectly well, but you can tell when they're just not really alert to interest in you or, or, or interest in what you're talking about. Um, and, and you can sometimes you try and try and try and to get them interested in something, uh, some, some mutual interest and, and you fail. Other times you sit next to somebody and you know from the moment you, you start talking, it's going to be a great conversation because they're, they're just interested in the world and they're interested in, in people. So what is this curiosity divide between the curious and, and, and the incurious? Um, I, that was the first question. And the second question was, what is it about the modern world that's driving people to one side or the other of this divide? Um, and one of the one of the quotes that that inspired me when I came across it in uh, a column by David Brooks in the, in the New York Times was this one: the, the the amount of information in front of us in the in the the internet age is is practically infinite. And the people who seem to do best are the people who have an almost obsessive need to follow their curiosity. So so the internet has. To, to an unprecedented extent, right, has leveled the, the playing field of access to information, right? So, so more people have more access to more information than at any time in history, right, hands down. That doesn't mean, that doesn't correlate to an increase in curiosity. Some people are taking advantage of that access, some people uh, are not. And you note that the title of Brooks's column here is What Machines Can't Do. And it just, it struck me partly through reading that, partly through reading around this, that that's one of the, that's a very kind of powerful thought that actually computers are getting smarter and smarter, <clears throat> excuse me, but there is no computer that, as far as we know, uh, is curious. Um, and that is still something that's a human quality um, that we ought to cultivate at a time when the machines are taking away a lot of the things that we regard as our own, lots of areas of work. Um, and so if you're going to survive in the kind of, you know, the, the, the career, the workplace of the future where AIs are taking away um, so, so, much, uh, so much of the, the more repetitive uh, work that, and the more kind of algorithmic work that humans do, then it pays to be curious. Because at the end of the day, and Picasso was somebody who saw this, you know, just as computers were uh, uh, becoming, a, you know, something that some people talked about. So when he was talking in 1964, there were still these huge, huge machines that took up huge uh, rooms. Um, uh, but he, he saw something towards the end of his life, which was that computers only give you answers. They're not very good at asking questions. So computers are smart. They're not curious. They're, they're brilliant at giving and they're even better, you know, unimaginably better than, than when he was around uh, at giving us answers. But as Kevin Kelly says, now Kevin Kelly, for those of you who don't know, he's a, he's a Silicon Valley uh, technologist and futurist who, who thinks very deeply about these questions. And he was the one that brought the Picasso uh, quote to my attention. He said, he, he moving on from Picasso, he said, look, if you want an answer in the future, you will ask a machine. You know, our machines have got incredibly good at generating answers. So the role of humans is now to ask questions. Great question creators are the ones who will generate the new industries, the new brands and the new possibilities. So he talked about it almost like a, a question of supply and demand. You know, when the supply of something is, is plentiful, you have plenty of something the value of it tends to, the price of it goes down. Uh, you know, there are a huge amount of answers out there. So answers aren't as valuable as they, as they used to be. The really valuable things and the, and the really kind of valuable uh, people in the workplace will be the people who ask great questions. Um, and not just valuable in, in commercial terms, but the people who open up new fields of inquiry or make advances in, in whatever field they, they, they work in or, or study are the people who think very deeply about what, what the questions are and aren't, aren't satisfied by getting a quick answer to any question. So that's why I think that, that curiosity, particularly at this moment, as 
as computers become more intelligent um, and and kind of take over more and more of the running of our society. So I think curiosity is is is, is therefore becoming more valuable and 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 therefore something that we ought to think about a lot more than than we do because one of the things about it i think is that we take it for granted so we talk about it as this uh as this gift something that just sort of happens to us and the truth is is that whilst that's true in a sense of of, of children particularly young children it's not necessarily true of us as we grow up. Curiosity is actually something that we have to, to think about and put in an effort in and, and, and cultivate. So let me explain how curiosity works, first of all, which by the way, is not a simple question. And it's really interesting when I reviewed the, the psychological literature for, for this book, the, the, the amount of different theories and different approaches to this subject was was uh, stunning because the thing about curiosity is that it crosses all the wires of, of um, the academic study of psychology right the psych psychologists like to divide things into the cognitive function um, the the emotions um, and and the personality and instincts and drives curiosity takes place in all those places right it's head heart it's gut it's 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 everything um, so it's it's difficult for psychologists to kind of get their heads heads around, but the most simple and the most powerful theory of curiosity was proposed by uh, a, a psychologist and a behavioral economist called George Lowenstein. And Lowenstein just came up with this very, very simple model, which I think is very useful, which is that the curiosity is what happens when you have a little bit of information about something, but you have just enough information to know that you don't know everything. So he called this the, the information gap or the curiosity gap, right? So when, when you're in that gap, when you're in that zone of, of curiosity is because you know something about the subject, but you, you, you have the sense that you don't know everything and therefore you go, oh, I really wanna know. So the reason, let me, there's a few reasons why this is actually a really kind of revealing and, 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 and insightful uh, approach. The first one is that he points out that if you don't know anything about a subject, you're probably not gonna be very curious about it. If you know everything, or you think you know everything about a subject, you're not going to be very curious about, about it. If you know something about a subject, but you don't know everything, you're gonna be curious about it. So say that we're talking at a, 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 a party and you say, uh, in the days when we had such things, and you say to me, you know, say you drop in a really interesting, provocative uh, fact about opera, and I don't know anything about opera, um, and I just pass on that on that fact. You drop in, I just move on to a different topic, and you think, wow, that's a what an incurious person this this guy is. Um, and then say um, we're we're talking, and you drop in a really interesting fact about. Um, uh, I don't know, politics. And I leap on it and I go, that's fascinating. I didn't know that. Tell me more. And you go, hey, you know what? This guy really is curious. So, you know, because I know something about politics and then you've told me something that I don't know, I suddenly get curious. If I don't know anything about it and I don't know where to start, I'm not gonna get cu curious. So curiosity drives my learning, but learning also drives my curiosity. And, and that, that kind of, that dynamic is, is very important to, to bear in mind. Here's another way to, to think about the, the curiosity gap. Storytellers are very skilled at, at driving your curiosity. And in fact, they drive a particular type of curiosity. We're gonna talk about two basic types of curiosity, and this is the first one. Diversive curiosity. So diversive curiosity is, is essentially what we've been talking about, which is hunger for new information, hunger for the novel, uh, not the novel as in uh, the literature, literary novel, but as in the new. Um, and storytellers are very good at stimulating our diversive curiosity. So what does Agatha Christie do in the first few pages of one of her books? She'll give you some information and then she'll make you aware that you don't have all the information. 
right? So, so she'll she'll give you the information that that uh, you know Colonel Fotherington Smythe was 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 killed, murdered in the library, beaten over the head with a, a piece of lead piping. Um, but she leaves this stonking curiosity gap, information gap, which is we don't know who done it. Okay, and and that curiosity gap draws you in to the book. And then because she's a master storyteller, and this is what master storytellers do, at every, at every page you turn or every chapter you, you turn, she drops some more information in, which opens up another curiosity gap and you want to close that. And basically you're turning the pages because you're getting a bit more, she's feeding out this unspooling this, this information and every bit of information you get raises a question and opens up another curiosity gap. Okay, oh, right, oh, now I need to know that. And now I need to know that. And finally, when you know everything and you know who done it, who knocked off Fotherington Smythe, bang, your curiosity is gone, right? So by the end of the uh, an Agatha Christie novel, you don't have any, have any curiosity left, but she's used diversive curiosity to pull, pull you through the, the whole thing. And by the way, any storyteller, um, whether it's the first few pages of a, of a novel or, or, or the, the opening five minutes of a, of a movie, um, or indeed, you know, if you're, if you're giving a lecture or a talk, you want to give people just enough information to make them aware that they don't know anything and to make them want it to, to go on. And the movies or the books that make, that do that badly are the ones that give you too much information or too little information. You know, so if you're really confused and you don't know what the hell's going on, you're not gonna be curious about how this turns out. Um, if they make it very clear that this is a cliched movie and you know how it's going to turn out, you're not going to be interested in how it turns out. They give you just enough information to, to make you know that what you don't know, you'll carry on. Now, we're going to talk about the second type of, epi sorry, the second type of curiosity, which is epistemic curiosity. Remember when I said that the, the, you get to the end of an Agatha Christie novel and your curiosity is sated, right? nobody ever rereads an Agatha Christie novel. I, I'm probably, there are some people that, that, that do, but, but they're not really designed to be reread, right? Unlike, uh, say, say, The Great Gatsby, right? Which I just recently reread and re remembered how fantastic it is. And I'll read, I'll, I'll read it again because it makes me deeply curious, but it doesn't actually give me the answer. It doesn't, doesn't really tell me like what's going on. Who is Gatsby? What does he care about? Um, and actually, it creates a much deeper kind of curiosity, which I'm going to call uh, epistemic curiosity. Well, I say I'm going to call it these. These are two kind of major terms from from the literature on, literature on curiosity. So epistemic curiosity is about um, knowledge. Right? In, in, in its simplest form, it's about accumulating knowledge and building a uh, uh, layer and, and on layer of, of knowledge. So diversive curiosity is the hunger for that new information, for that answer. Get me off the beaten path and go, ah, now I need to know this. The diversity of curiosity is important because it kind of, it, it, it ignites the spark of curiosity. But diversive curiosity, if that's all it is, it just becomes this slightly shallow kind of chasing after new information. You know, uh, it's like this, the, the link that you're, you're clicking on, the, 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 the headline that you click through to, to read some, some, some cheesy, boring story. Um, the email subject headline that sounds interesting, you click through and it's not, it's not very interesting. You get stuck in this kind of shallow cycle of, of diversive curiosity if you're not careful. Epistemic curiosity is about turning that, that hunger for new information into something much deeper and longer lasting. And it's the kind of curiosity that, that scientists and, and, and innovators have. Um, it's the kind of curious, curiosity that sustains a kind of lifetime's pursuit of knowledge. And it's really a kind of curiosity which is more about questions than it is about answers. It's about always looking for the next question. And every answer you get, the reason you find the answer is exciting is that it, answers, it, it, it opens up um, yet more questions. Once you get into that mode of curiosity, uh, then that's the really kind of deep, fulfilling type of curiosity, which I think is, is so important. So just to, to summarize those, those two types of curiosity, because they're useful to bear in mind. 
Diverse of curiosity is about the hunger for, for, for novelty, for new information, for, for closing that information gap. Epistemic curiosity is about accumulating knowledge over time. Diversive curiosity is impulsive. You just kind of get, you, you, you get seized by it and you immediately want to, to, to do something about it. Epistemic curiosity is cultivated. You don't necessarily feel the urge to be epistemically curious all the time. It's something you have to cultivate, put in a conscious effort uh, into cultivating. Diversive curiosity is like scratching an itch. It's very, it's very much like a drive to, to get an answer. Epistemic, epistemic curiosity is about exploring a question. And this relates to, to another distinction I talk about in the book, which I, I, I think is, a, is another one to bear in mind, but it's very much related to diversive and epistemic curiosity. Um, and it's the distinction between puzzles and mysteries. And, and it's a good one to think about when you're, um, when you're presenting uh, an idea or you, you're giving a lesson or, or you're kind of explaining something is, am I presenting this as a puzzle or uh, a, a mystery? Um, so the distinction actually came from um, uh, an analyst of uh, the Cold War who talked about the different ways that intelligence services now approach their job um, versus the way they did in the Cold War. Um, so during the Cold War, the, the job of, uh, uh, of the CIA or MI6 or whoever it was, was largely about getting information, getting answers to very specific questions. So it's about solving puzzles. So you needed to know, and of course I'm hugely simplifying, but you needed to know uh, how many warheads do, do the Russians have, right? You, you can go out and you can get pretty good intelligence on that. You can say, well, they've got 2,734 of, the, of these types of warheads. Here's the answer to this puzzle that, that we've been puzzling over. In the kind of the post-Cold War age where you've got this multipolar, much more confusing, much more chaotic world, those kind of puzzles are less important to you. The, the really kind of difficult and the interesting ones and the important ones to, to the intelligence services are mysteries. They're, um, why is there so much unrest in the Middle East? And, 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 and where is this headed? What do we need to understand about uh, the, the, the young generation of uh, Iranians, right? These aren't um, questions that are susceptible to simple answers. You can't just say, well, it's 46. Um, you need to think deeply about, about those, those, those questions and you will never get a satisfactory, completely satisfactory answer or you shouldn't. Um, but, and so puzzles are the things that give you these, you know, you solve them, you get the answer. Mysteries are these things that you just want to keep digging away at and burrowing uh, away at. Um, so an Agatha Christie novel is a, is a puzzle. The Great Gatsby is a mystery. And I really think that's the best way to think about your, you know, your field of knowledge is, you know, I, I want it to be, and I want it to be for others, essentially a mystery that they get absolutely fascinated by and they never stop being fascinated by. And then I think once people get into that mode of thinking, this I'm um, calling it the circle of epistemic curiosity, you could call it the circle of mystery, I think it sounds slightly like a cult, um, where the more you know, uh, the more you realize what you don't know. And that makes you want to know more. So, so yes, curiosity drives learning, but also the learning drives more curiosity. It's, it's a dynamic circular process. Um, and I think that's the kind of ideal state of, of uh, uh, epistemic curiosity that, that we should be seeking in our lives and, and seeking to uh, engage others in. Um, and there's another dimension to this, which is that the more you learn, uh, the more knowledge you accumulate through epistemic curiosity, the, the easier and the better it gets, uh, you get at acquiring more knowledge, right? So the more you learn, the, be the better you get at learning. Um, this is another thing that marks us as very different from computers. So uh, if you think about um, your computer, if, if you load it up with files, lots of different heavy files, you know, huge amounts of information, huge amounts of data, it slows down, right? 
it gets slower and slower and slower and until you have to delete all those files. The human mind works completely the opposite way around. The, the more information, the more knowledge that you, that you acquire and assimilate, the faster your brain works. The, 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 the increase, you know, having an increase in processing power in your, your central processing unit, the more on knowledge you work. So that's, that's the nature of, of expertise, right? And an expert chess player can look at a chessboard and immediately see what's going on. The brain is just speeded up in that in that field of knowledge. Let me give you a very kind of simple demonstration of this um, uh, in, in, your, in your own life. So if I ask you to memorize that string of symbols, uh, they happen to be numbers, but they could be any kind of symbol. Um, yeah, I, I won't even really ask you to do it because I think it would be, you, you're probably looking at that and quite rightly you're saying that's impossible. Nobody could memorize that, that many symbols in uh, uh, you know, 30 seconds or a minute. However, if I ask you to memorize that, you've, you've got it, right? I mean, <laughs> I, I, I showed you that for a second and, and you said, okay, Lucy and the Sky with Diamonds, I'm, I can rem remember that, I'm not gonna forget it for the rest of the day. Um, there is no actual difference between that as a problem, as a memorization problem, and that as a memorization problem. In fact, that is, there's more symbols for you to remember uh, on that slide than, the, than the, there is on the one before. The difference is knowledge. The reason you find that subject, the reason your brain works much faster to memorize that, to process that, is because you know more. You know more about, uh, you know, you know about letters and and how letters form into words, um, and how uh, and how words form into sentences. You know about the popular culture. You know, you probably know that's a, a Beatles song. Um, you know how to kind of organize that knowledge. Lucy in the Sky with Dance. Um, and so it becomes a whole different problem for your brain to solve and a much easier one for you, for you to, to memorize it. Um, and this is just a very kind of crude illustration of, of a basic principle, which is that when people uh, know more, it's actually, it actually speeds up the acquisition of, of information to their brain because there are existing networks of knowledge in the brain that are ready to receive and assimilate the new knowledge that, that's coming in. This is why, by the way, you know, this is a great problem in, in uh, education, particularly at younger stages, where you get some kids coming to school who haven't had the benefit of a kind of, call it a rich cognitive environment in, in psychology, right? So maybe they come from a house where there's lots of books on the shelves and, and, and the parents read to them, the parents, you know, Often this is to do with economic circumstance and the parents just don't have money to spend on books so they don't have time to, to read books with their kids. But So for whatever reason it is, some kids get to school having a base level of general knowledge about, about the world and are used to kind of assimilating new knowledge. Some kids get to school not having that. And then they can put in the same amount of effort at school and the, the kid who already starts with the base level of knowledge just starts learning much, much faster because the brain has been speeded up by, by this existing knowledge. So this kid who's putting in the same amount of effort and sees his contemporaries speeding away from him or her, yeah, how do you think they feel? They, they don't think, um, well, this is clearly a, a, just a, a, a cognitive function of the brain. You know, I, I, I'm not assimilating information at as fast a rate as this person because I didn't start with the same base. No, they think I'm stupid um, and they think, screw this. Um, and so it becomes a self-fulfilling process and that, that educational gap widens. So, I mean, this is a whole other question, but the, you know, that mean, that's why schools um, who, who have these kind of mixed intakes have to put in a huge amount of effort to, to catch that kid up with that kid right, you know, as early on as possible, because it's a compounding process, right? Okay, so given that we have a, we've discovered how, or we knew, I'm sure we knew already, how important curious curiosity is right now. Um, 
and given that we all agree that's a wonderful thing to 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 be and to be sustained by by curiosity the question is you know why aren't we all go back to the question i started with why why, why aren't we all you know intensely curious how do we become incurious in a way that's the more powerful question than than, than how do we become curious so how do we lose it because the fact is we do absolutely start with it so in that sense the idea of curiosity as a gift is is not is not stupid um we are born with this remarkable uh genetically biologically driven quest for for knowledge um and, and from information and when you think about it just the fact that children ask questions seemingly instinctively is remarkable because they seem to intuit that there is a whole world of knowledge that they don't know. I, you know, I don't, this is not, you know, we shouldn't take this for granted. As far as we know, other, other animals don't have this. We have this inbuilt sense that we don't know stuff and that therefore we want to know it. And uh, accompanying that, we, we have a sense that these, these big people, these adults are gatekeepers to this invisible world of knowledge. So we very soon start pumping them for information, uh, like, like journalists kind of working a, a source, saying, hey, God, what's going on here? Why is the sky blue? Um, and between the so a psychologist uh, did a study on this and, and they established a kind of rough answer to how many questions, how many explanatory questions do children ask between the ages of, of three and five? And something like 40,000 uh, explanatory questions uh, per year. Um, and so explanatory questions, you know, the why and the how questions, not just can, can, I, can I get my lunch now? Um, now, those of you who have small ch children will know that this can get somewhat wearing. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's not all a, a joyful kind of intellectual exchange. There are points where the kind of like, why, but why, but why uh, conversation gets, gets very hard. But this is, you know, this is curiosity in action. And it it's, goes to something very important about human development, which is we spend much longer than animals, uh, than other animals and other mammals um, in a stage of kind of um, helplessness. Um, we, you know, if you, a, a, a lamb or a, a, a baby horse, they're, they're up and running and, you know, dating and getting mortgages out w within a few days of, of being born, right? Um, children, babies just can't do anything. They can't feed themselves. They can't survive with, without, without adult care for years. Um, and in fact, you know, children aren't designed to, to look after themselves, survive um, until they're well into to, uh, to adolescence. And in fact, for some of us, you know, we're well beyond that. Um, so uh, why, why would nature do that? Or, you know, what's the, what's the evolutionary logic behind that? Um, and it's that we are able to absorb a huge amount of knowledge and learning about, uh, about how to survive in this environment. Humans are essentially cultural creatures. We're not restricted to any one biological niche. We can live in the jungle, we can live in the desert, we can live uh, uh, in, the, in the cold, in the, in the and, the, and we, we get around, we spread ourselves around the world because we create uh, knowledge about how to survive. Um, and we pass on knowledge about how to how to start a fire, how to how to cook meat, how to build a, a shelter, from generation to, to generation. That's how we survive and, and how we propagate as, as a species. And so, therefore, we have this built-in kind of feature, which is we spend years not doing much, not focusing on the grubby business of survival. We let our parents and carers do that. All we're doing is being curious about the world and pulling in inf information about knowledge about, about how, how everything works. And uh, actually, I'll just get back before I go that. Now, that only lasts that kind of stage of intense curiosity, uh, you know, up until those kind of young to, to, to uh, before the age of 10, really, you're starting to 
the number of questions you ask starts to de decline. Um, and there are reasons for that. Not all of these are, are, are terrible reasons. You know, we often say, ah, oh, schools are killing curiosity or, you know, the world is killing, killing curiosity in some way. Um, maybe, and, and, and you know, there's, there's, there's an element of that. There's an, also an element of children do start to learn some of the essentials that they need to get through the world. And therefore, you know, if you're still asking 40,000 questions by the time you're 12, maybe that's because you haven't learned anything at all. Um, and so you should expect to see some sort of a natural um, decline. But what, you, what you're hoping for um, is that it deepens into more kind of epistemic forms of curiosity where people are actually saying, okay, now I know what to, I, need, I have the knowledge I need to get by, but how do I deepen that into epistemic curiosity? And of course, the in terms of the environment that, that we're in, the learning environment that we're in, um, the internet is a hugely important factor now. And going back to something we I touched on at, at the beginning, we have this amazing source of answers. Now, this is a double-edged sword. I think the internet is both uh, it's the best thing that ever happened to curiosity and and, and the worst thing. Uh, the, there's a great quote from somebody who said, uh, the internet's making smart people smarter and stupid people stupider. Um, and I think there's something in that, and I think it applies to curiosity too. Um, it's not that it's bad for curiosity. Um, it's not that it's always good for curiosity. It's making curious people more curious and incurious people more incurious. If you're a curious person, you you have this you know incredible access to information uh, and to expertise, uh, you know, whether it's via Google or Wikipedia or YouTube, whatever it is. And you can re get really interested in something and you actually don't need to be at a university or, or a school to explore that topic in some depth. If you're an incurious person, the internet is also great, right? If your instinct is to be lazy and to be incurious and say, well, I just need the answer to this and I'm not really interested in, in opening up a deeper question, then fine, you just go to Google and you you look at the top line or you just read the first paragraph of, of the Wikipedia entry. Um, you have all the answers you need to get by very quick, very quickly, um, but that doesn't provoke deeper epistemic curiosity. Um, okay, so, so this is a, a quote from uh, the guy who used to be head of search at Google and he was interviewed a few years ago and the journalist said, uh, now that people have got used to using Google, have they got much better at asking questions in, in the search box? And he sighed and he said, no, it's the other way around. The more accurate the machine gets, the lazier the questions become. Um, and so that's the danger of, of, of the internet. The better it gets at, at giving us answers, um, the worse we get at asking questions. Should be the other way around. And again, I want to relate it back to this distinction between puzzles and, and mysteries. The internet used as this kind of source of, of instant answers is really, it's really people using the internet as a way of solving puzzles. And when you can solve a puzzle really quickly, it means that it doesn't deepen into a mystery for you over time. Um, so this is JJ Abrams. Um, he's a film movie director um, and uh, so he's talking about it from a storyteller's point of view, but I think it's true of, of, of education too. It says, you know, we can lead to this, this sense of instant understanding very quickly. And we get this instant gratification from uh, getting an answer about, and he's talking about in terms of plots, right? People can go on the internet and they can find out how start, the new Star Wars movie is going to end. You know, and everyone wants to, everyone's all over every new movie. They're like, oh, what happened here? Why did this happen? What's going to happen? And he said, I think that's a pity because I think the world is being demystified. Um, and, I, I, and I really love the kind of the, the, the deep mysteries that, that the great movies can, can present us with. Um, and I think there's an analogy with, with just the way we relate to the internet as a learning environment. Yes, we can use it to, to answer questions and solve puzzles, but we should use it as a way of pursuing deeper mysteries. And I do think that's possible. I just think it's very tempting not to do it that way. And the final kind of issue with the way we use the internet is summed up in this question from a Reddit forum. Um, somebody asked, if someone from the 1950s suddenly appeared today, what would be the most difficult thing to explain to them about life today? The most popular answer 
was this. I possess a device in my pocket that is capable of accessing the entirety of information known to man. I use it to, to look at pictures of cats and get into arguments with strangers. So, you know, it's, it's, it's funny because it's true. <laughs> you know, we have this uh, uh, incredible device um, and it, does, it is like the, the, the key to, to Alexandrian libraries of, of knowledge. Um, and yet we spend, a, we spend it looking at, yeah, whatever it is, pictures of cats. Look, I, lo I love cats, but, but um, we should be, you know, using our, our electronic superpowers to develop our curiosity. But that requires consciously thinking about doing so and put, putting an effort into it and focusing our, our curiosity in a way that unfortunately we're not often encouraged to. So that's, you know, the real kind of fundamental lesson of, the, of this talk and, and of the book is, is that curiosity, you should think about it like as a, as a muscle that if you don't use, will, will gradually atrophy and, 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 you know, wither away. Um, it's something that we have to use and, and, and exercise and pay attention to. And sometimes uh, just like exercise, that means you putting effort in even when we don't feel like it. <clears throat> um, and there might be some resistance to that, right? But then over time, the, the benefits are immense. So I'm just going to finish uh, uh, with a few kind of slightly more practical tips on, on how to practice curiosity, because I think you need to think about it as a practice, not just a, a, a psychological trait. Um, and then we, we can have a, have a discussion. Um, but just two or three things to, to, to think about. One of them is how do you how do you organize your, your learning, right? Okay, so this is this is a, a question for for adults as, as they go through life. Um, and it's obviously a question that you think about in terms of education and learning very deeply. But I think whoever you are, you know, whether you're in education or, or you're not, you should think about it in the same way, which is you should develop some specialist interests and then you should be ha have a general interest in, in everything else. Yeah. The danger of being curious in the diversive sense is that you're so interested in, in everything. You want to learn about you know, Darwinism and, and, and you want to learn about uh, uh, Kim Kardashian, maybe not Kim Kardashian, but you want to learn about everything, um, that you end up only having a very shallow grasp of, of, of everything. The, the, the key to it is to have what, I mean, Horace Walpole says one thing, but let's just say, you know, a few fields of, of knowledge that you go very deeply into and where you know pretty much, you know more than 99% of people, you know, you know more than the average person certainly, but you know more than most people uh, about these things. And then you should be interested and have a little bit of knowledge about as many other things as possible. You know, so I think Walpole put it very well. That's the, the whole secret of life, to be interested in one thing profoundly and a thousand things well. Um, in business and in HR, they sometimes talk about people as, as T-shaped, uh, the, the kind of people they're, they're looking to hire. So they want people who have a kind of expertise in one particular discipline, um, one particular field, field of knowledge, but who have uh, knowledge about all the other adjacent disciplines. So you want to hire a software developer who has deep expertise in this type of software development, but I also want that software de developer to have some knowledge of uh, design and marketing and finance. Because the world is increasingly collaborative, people are working in teams a lot more, those teams go a lot better when everybody knows a little bit about how everybody else's job works, but are also specialized in, 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 their, own, in their own field. So that kind of T-shaped approach, that specialized and generalized approach is, is very important. This is a kind of a, a practical thing that we can all do. We can do it as, as, as students, but we, we can do it uh, throughout our lives, um, which is to, to give some thought to um, calling it building a, a second brain, uh, but using ex our tools, our external tools, whether that's a, a simple one like a notebook, um, or, or uh, a sophisticated one like, like some of the apps that are out there to, to retain and organize our knowledge. You know, so um, 
just think about everything that's available to you as uh, potential components of your, your, your second brain, right? So you, you're kind of giving this brain some, some assistance by saying, okay, as I, as I read this book and I find passages that I think are really interesting or insightful or just beautiful, um, I'm going to make a note of them. It doesn't matter how you do it. You could do it in, in, a, in a written notebook you can do it uh, in a word file, you can do it uh, yeah, in an app, however you like, but, but keep a note of what you're learning. Keep a note about what, you, what you've observed or somebody said something really interesting today and you noted it, or you just had a brilliant idea you know, in, in, in the shower, um, keep a note of it. Uh, you um, say, so you, you, know, you, you read a brilliant article in the newspaper or you read a great article online, um, bookmark it, tag it, Make sure you can find it again. Basically, never underestimate your own capacity to forget things. <laughs> you know, don't rely on, on your ability to retain that insight or that really interesting thought um, or that brilliant article that you, that, that you read. Uh, you, you, you very quickly find that it, it all it gets lost. Um, and so put it all together. Actually, it's not just important to do this as a retrieval system, but as a combinatorial system, right? So I, I actually, one of the things I do is a very basic thing, which is um, I have a, a Word document, which I call my, my Spark file. I borrowed it from uh, that idea from someone else. But I just go through, I, whenever I have an interesting thought or I see an interesting quote, um, I just make a, a, a note in that Spark file. And deliberately, I don't organize that one. Um, so that's just a kind of uh, a crazy, you know, mosaic of, of different thoughts, different ideas from, from different fields. But actually that has a value in itself because when I go back to it and sometimes, you know, every week or so I kind of look through the whole thing, these crazy connections start jumping out from all over the place, right? So I'm seeing connections between different fields and different types of knowledge. Um, and, and as you know, creative thinking depends on, on, on that kind of combination. Uh, of taking two unrelated things and bringing them together and to, to make something new. So it's actually a great way of sparking new ideas and, and, and new thoughts whenever I'm stuck in a rut. So build a second brain, use, use uh, everything at your disposal to, to, to keep, to retain and organize uh, your knowledge and, and use it to spark new thinking and new ideas. And then finally, um, just, uh, and I guess is you know the most directly relevant to, to teaching and uh, and to parenting too, which is how do I create uh, a curious environment in in my in my classroom or or, or at home? I mean, there's, there's lots to say here, and there's no kind of like definitive answer, but I'll say a couple of things. One is that uh, there's this really interesting study that uh, uh, a cognitive psychologist did where they, they, they studied um, and they recorded the conversations in homes of, of, of different families. And they were trying to work out why some children as, the, as they grew up seemed to be more, had to have their curiosity more active, be more actively curious than, than other children. And that's a very complex question. But one of the things that they noticed was that the, the children who grew up to be, to be very curious uh, were in households where their parents didn't just answer the question, um, but asked questions of them. So you could be in a household where the, 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 the parent is, <coughs> excuse me, answering your question, which is, you know, a good start because some parents just don't, right? Some parents just don't have the, the time or the energy, right? I'm not bl blaming, judging any parents at all, but, um, if, you, if you're a child and you have a parent who answers your question, um, well, that's good. It's even better if your parent uh, answers the question or tries to help you answer the question, but then asks another question. It says, well, um, what do you think? What do you think about this? Or, or, or how does that change your thinking? Or how does that connect to, to, to what else you know? And I think probably even better if the parent and or the teacher is uh, prepared to admit that they don't know everything. Um, and I feel the pressure when my children ask me questions, I feel the pressure to, 
uh, you know, my children are young and I, I, I feel a pressure to go, well, um, yes, well, the sky is blue because, um, and, and it's a point where I, I realized you, you don't have to know the answers. <laughs> you know, if you know, great. If you can help them find out the answer, great. But just admitting that you don't know, but you find the question really interesting uh, is actually a really kind of powerful way to, to model curiosity. I think that applies in the classroom and, and, and at home and, and even uh, you know, at work, um, you see you know, the, the, the best managers, the best leaders, <clears throat> they don't worry so much about their status in the room that they have to kind of prove that they know everything all the time. They're quite happy to say, you know what, that's a great question, I'd have the answer to that. Um, I'd love to know. Um, and once they do that, that, that opens up permission for everyone else to, to behave in the same way. And I think what, what joins these things together, you know, the, the, are the two killers of, of curiosity that kind of exist at either end of, of uh, the spectrum. A curious culture is, is going to be killed by either complacency or fear. So complacency where people feel that, you know, whether it's kids or, 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 or grown-ups, that I pretty much know all, all I need to know now. <laughs> um, which I think, by the way, somehow how my five-year-old feels about the world. My five-year-old goes through these periods where he's like, well, you yeah, know, I think I've done enough learning now. I think I'm pretty happy. And you have to remind him that, hey, yeah, I think there's some more stuff you could learn. Um, but it's the same like dynamic, whether you're, you're five or, or you're 65, frankly. You know, you, you, we all need to be reminded. We need to remind each other all the time of all the stuff that we don't know. Um, and, 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 and isn't that great, by the way? So that's complacency, that's one thing we need to be worried about. The other thing we need to be careful of is fear. Um, and, and, and fear of uh, exposing yourself uh, as not knowing everything, right? Or, or, or fear of asking a dumb question. Um, you know, fear of asking a question is going to upset somebody. You know, sometimes people give, give the idea that actually if you ask a question about this, you're, you're somehow kind of in, insulting me. All those things are obviously terrible for, for, for curiosity. Um, and so you want people to feel that they are in this great kind of safe environment where it's okay not to know everything. The only thing it's not okay is to, to know that you don't know and to be totally fine with that. <laughs> um, so um, I think I'm going to, to leave it there. Um, and, uh, and thank you very much for, for, for your, your patience. Um, as, I, as I went through all that. I um, hope I didn't go on too long, but I'm very I'm happy to, to take uh, questions and, and to have a chat. Great, thank you so much, Ian, and I can hear all those silent claps behind there. <laughs> everybody attending, but since we're in a webinar situation, we can't hear them. Um, Sheldon, would you like to just remind people how they can ask the two ways we could ask questions here today? Sure, uh, there's two ways. So there should be a and a button on the bottom of your screen. And we've got one question sitting there right now, uh, as well as you should be able to raise your hand. There should be a little raise hand button there, and then we can just call on you virtually. So the first question that we've got, uh, I think you've touched on, uh, but uh, by so the question is this, by answering their questions clearly and immediately, do you stop a child's curiosity, kind of in the same way that, a, that the Agatha Christie book does? Yeah, I think you do. <laughs> I mean, there's no hard and fast rules here. Sometimes that's the right thing to do. But I think there is a danger that if you do answer too quickly and immediately and too definitively, you just kind of shut down the conversation. Um, you know, you, you, you've treated the question like a puzzle when actually you should be saying, this is the gateway to, to a mystery. You know, how, how can I show them that there's a larger mystery here that, that we don't know about, that you don't know about, that I don't know about? Um, so uh, yeah, I try and I try and do it myself with with my children. Is they'll ask me a question, and if I know the answer, I'll give them the answer. But I, I quite often actually put it quite equivocally, because the more you think about it, the less you actually know for sure. And so I'll say, well, I think it's this, and to, or to the best of our knowledge, or a lot of people think it's it's this, right? And that's probably what most most people think. Um, but it's a difficult question because ABC. And you know, 
insofar as it's not always possible, but if you can draw them into more of a conversation about it, then I think that's when the, the real curiosity starts to be unlocked. Great, thank you. Um, and again, you can raise your hand on the side, we'll look for those so you can, and we can unmute you so you can actually ask it by speaking or um, type it in the Q&A. This is a new trial for us to try to do it in the webinar fashion, uh, but we'd love some more if anybody has other questions. Um, I'd like to, to uh, ask something, even though I'm not um, one of the folks in, uh, as attendees, but uh, I guess I can take that privilege. Um, listening to you, Ian, uh, obviously a lot of what you have to say we agree with. Coming from the uh, wearing the hat of, uh, of an educator and, and uh, someone running a school, one of the challenges we're always facing is schools as institutions and how they're evolving and changing. And you addressed some of this uh, at the end of your talk, but I wonder if you have more thoughts around perhaps what schools should not only start doing, but also what they should stop doing. Uh, schools have functioned a certain way for centuries, as we know. And as you mentioned, the knowledge base that we all have on one level has increased exponentially. So schools no longer are the monopoly of knowledge uh, where we can be the gatekeepers of what kids can find out or learn on that level or not learn. So given the new environment that we're in, uh, and that's been the case for quite a while now, schools are often hard uh, institutions to change rapidly, but what kinds of things might schools do to change uh, to, to really engender and spark curiosity in the learner? Okay, so I think um, this is related to, to what I've just been talking about. I, I think there's a kind of cultural, uh, almost like an attitudinal shift that, that has to take place where teachers, no longer need to see themselves as the 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 authority with a capital a uh, on 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 the subject um, and now it doesn't mean they they need to be authoritative so they need to have you know not proper deep knowledge of, of of the subject but they needn't project that aura of omniscience that some of my teachers did at school which you know and they were and there some of them were excellent teachers but I just don't think that works anymore um because one of the the effects of the internet is it levels you know opens up access to information not all of it you know some of it terrible information some of it good information um but that also has the effect of kind of leveling, leveling uh, or narrowing levels of authority, right? It sort of flattens the, the, the playing field of authority, right? You see that at every level of society, right? You, you see that in the family, like the way I talk to my children is very different from the way my parents talk to me. And that's, that's natural. It's just kind of it, it evolves over the years. We've become, you know, for better and for worse, more democratic at every level, right? Less hierarchical. Um, and so, I think teachers have to, to, this is aside from the behavior question, right? Keep, <laughs> keeping your kids well, well ordered in the classroom is the only way that, that, that they're gonna learn. Um, uh, but when it comes to knowledge and, and imparting knowledge, I think you really kind of need to strike this delicate balance between saying, yes, I, obviously I know more than you about this because I've studied it for, for, for a long time, um, but I don't know everything. I don't have, you know, I'm not an answer machine. I don't have all the answers to, to all these, these puzzles. Um, but what I, I am is somebody who knows so much that I'm actually incredibly excited about learning more myself. And, you know, the more I talk with you and the more questions you ask, even if you don't know anything, that helps me learn. So we can actually help each other learn that, that that's great, right? We're starting from, from different levels, but uh, you know, I think just to me, like that, that's the most important thing is conveying that your enthusiasm for learning does not cease when you've learned 
something. It's the opposite way around. And, and teachers need to kind of model that and, and, and embody that um, rather than just saying, look, uh, you have all these questions, I have all the answers, so uh, let's go. <laughs> you know? um, I, I, I don't think um, that schools need to um, radically reinvent around the internet. Um, because I, I, I think the internet is, is a supplement and you, you incorporate it into the way you taught and, the, and, and how you teach and, and, and how the kids learn, but it actually doesn't change the fundamental structure of, of what you're doing. I think it's very dangerous when people, some sort of Silicon Valley visionaries say, hey, you know, we don't need to teach kids facts or knowledge anymore. They can use Google for that. Um, we should just be focusing on, on curiosity or whatever it is. You know, a lot of the part of, you know, my philosophy of curiosity is that, as you see, you know, knowledge drives curiosity and curiosity drives knowledge. You, you, you need, you know, you need to kind of keep that, that going. Um, and if you, if, if kids are uh, trying to assimilate new information all the time, you know, just Googling everything all the time, then their brain isn't going to work as fast um, as it is than if they've, they acquire and, and, and absorb and assimilate knowledge. Um, and then, so the more they know, actually, the better they get use it at using the internet, right? So don't just imagine that, you know, kids, you just give these kids uh, an iPhone and Google and they, they'll be PhDs. It, it, that's not how it works, right? You still need adults to, to guide and focus and organize what they're doing. And the more they do that, the better they're gonna get at, at using the internet, you know, in a way that helps them learn and makes them more curious. All right, uh, we have another question here. Um, and it kind of connects to what you were just talking about is this tension between the expert and, and still nurturing the curiosity. Um, my child is convinced that what teacher or father or another authority says is true and argues with me. Is it good to challenge that authority and encourage my child not to trust that particular fact automatically? Doesn't it undermine trust in authorities or in opposite, does it support critical thinking? What are your thoughts? It's, yeah, I mean, I, yeah, yeah, I, I, I think it su supports um, critical thinking. It's really interesting that there's um, going back to what I was saying about why evolution has designed this period of of, of helplessness, essentially, of physical helplessness, um, uh, or at least a, a period where we need adults to 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 um, to help us. It also, at the same time, has uh, evolved this mechanism where kids are very good, even babies are very good at working out who is a reliable kind of gatekeeper to, to, to the world of knowledge and who isn't. Um, so babies can distinguish quite quickly between somebody that they trust to give them good, good information and, and good knowledge and, and adults that they, they don't. It seems to be quite a sort of inbuilt thing, right? Which would, which would, makes sense uh, from the evolutionary point of view. So I think you have to think about authority slightly differently in this age than you did say 10, 20, 30 years ago. You don't get much authority just from being a, uh, an adult or not as much as you did or just from being a teacher, not as much as you, as you did. That, that hierarchy has been, has been narrowed. But you you still get authority from knowing stuff and from engaging you know and and sh and engaging in that knowledge you know in a way that shows that you you are interested in in what the other person has to say and that person is helping you think about the subject as as well. So not using it as a kind of tool to to impose a tool to impose your authority on them. Um, but uh, yeah, so so I I think that to, to go back to, to to the questioner, um, I think it's absolutely fine that your children question the, the authority, um, and and I I think just kind of saying well, but I know what I'm talking about and you don't, um, it's very tempting and I'm sure I've done it, but uh, it's not actually a way to um, to engage their brain. It really kind of shuts the conversation down. A lot of what I'm talking about really is is like, how do you find a way to keep the conversation going as long as it can, you know, to its natural end? Like, 
we have many ways of shutting conversations down. And sometimes when we're tired, we, we just want to say, yeah, okay, just be quiet, no more questions, right? That's, I, I just, I do that all, all the time. But ideally, right, you want to keep the conversation going for as long as you both can sustain it. And one of the other ways that we close conversations down is by giving the answer. We say, well, this is the answer. Next question. And so avoiding that temptation, avoiding giving that kind of authoritative answer is one way to keep the conversation going. And, and I think keeping the conversation going is very important. Thanks, Sian. Um, I don't see any other questions here, but I was, I'm a little curious about something that you said in your Spark um, journal and this idea, because another one of our learning principles is that learners connect and uh, consider complex ideas. And it feels like your idea of that you just don't go deep but in this day and age, you do need to make these transdisciplinary or these connections un, that not everybody has seen. And that really gives great new insight. And that's where you can contribute. Can you speak a little bit more how you do that? <laughs> because I'm very curious about that. I think we think about concept mapping. We think about different things that we do here at school. And you're doing it in a very different way in, as a writer, as a journalist, as a, a thinker. So I'd love to hear a little bit more about that. Um, okay, so there's a there's a kind of great um, passage in in David Hume, the, the Scottish philosopher, Enlightenment philosopher, uh, about what the nature of creative thinking is. I think he probably called it imaginative thinking or something. I'm not sure he would have used the word creativity, but it's essentially about creativity, and he he says. The, the, the remarkable thing about the human mind is its ability to form new ideas out of existing ideas. So every new idea is always some, you know, we make it up out of something we already know. So he talked about gold mountains. He said, there's nothing inherently interesting or creative about the idea of gold and there's nothing inherently creative or interesting about the idea of a mountain, but a gold mountain, well, that's really interesting. <laughs> um, and that, that very kind of basic principle is, that's, that's, what, that's what creative thinking is, that's what innovation is. You're putting together things from, from different fields. Um, and I think if you have specialisms, um, then you, even when you don't realize how those specialisms are going to come in, uh, useful or handy or, or, or you know to transform some other aspect of your life you should do it because they they will do it at some point you know, there's a there's a one of the famous things about steve jobs the founder of apple is that he spent uh he did a course in calligraphy when he was at university um just because he was curious about it because he had that kind of a mind he was interested in everything and he liked to go into things at depth when he could so he did a course in calligraphy and then later when he was designing the the mac the, the first mac um he saw that that you know the text was just computer text and he said well digital text so what why can't we have proper fonts on here and he kind of listed all the different fonts that, um and they installed font the fonts that he'd learned about in calligraphy uh on the mac and and then that was copied by Microsoft and in Windows. So, so that's the reason we have this, all these different typeset, you know, fonts on, on, on our machines. It's because Steve Jobs, you know, took a diversion from the beaten path and when he was at university, where he was studying computer science, to learn about something that he was really interested in. And then later on was able to combine, you know, that the collision of those 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 two different bits of knowledge, those different two different insights from different fields creates it created something very powerful that now billions of, of people uh, are, are grateful for. Um, so uh, yeah, I, I think, um, oh, the other, the other kind of great example is the Japanese bullet train. Um, when they were designing the, the, you know, kind of the, the nose of the train goes, tapers off like this rather beautifully. Um, and the reason for that is they had designed the train, it didn't have that nose and it was going through tunnels and it was kind of pushing all the air back and then the air coming out the other side and there would be this huge kind of boom, uh, huge sonic boom. And so they were kind of looking ways to, to get around that. Um, and one of the engineers 
had a deep specialized field of knowledge in uh, ornithology. He was really interested in, in, in bird, bird watching. And he had noticed the way that kingfishers enter the water, these long kind of tapered thin beaks, and they just, they slide into the water like that. So it doesn't kind of, they don't feel the impact. Um, and it was his suggestion that, that led to that beautiful tapering of, of, of the bullet train. So again, you know, you have these kind of fields of interest, these specializations, and, and you pursue them because hopefully, well, either because you have a job or you pursue, but hopefully because you're interested in them as well, or just because you're interested in them. And, and at some point, you know, they start talking to each other <laughs> um, and in ways that you didn't predict or expect. And all the, the spark file does or any tool like that is it just it's sort of intensifies and enhances that process that should be happening anyway. But it's 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 a way for me to kind of model that process you know, in pages. I can see, oh, that actually links up with that and that uh, and that's given give me a new idea. So it's a cheat, really. It's a, a kind of useful cheat. Great. Thank you. Um, I think uh, we don't have any further questions at this point, and I know that we've been on here for a bit of time, so I think we'll close it. But Ian, thank you so much. Again, I loved reading your book, and I, we love that you share your passion and your insights into all that you've discovered about curiosity, and you model curiosity and inspire us to continue our journey with curiosity and learning and that interplay. So thanks to everybody and uh, thanks for joining our first virtual Edge in Education. Thank you, Ian, and we hopefully will be I have an ongoing dialogue about curiosity and learning. Absolutely. Thank you very much. And thanks for listening, everyone. Thanks, thanks Ian. Thanks, Arnie. Bye now. <laughs>